Well, uh, welcome back after lunch. It's always the toughest talk, I think, after a nice hearty meal. Mm. Always starts to feel a little bit postprandial, a little bit sleepy. So my talk's on really intraocular and surface tumours. To give a guide as to what tumours are worrying, what aren't, and a little bit about you know, what London does as well. Or as I also like to think, the case of the suspicious, suspicious nevus, also known as what we treat and how we treat it. A little bit of background. Um, the first ophthalmic surgeon was appointed to Bart back in 1724. And the first sort of ocular oncologist at Bart's was Robert Foster Moore, appointed in 1926. And he's responsible for introducing radioactive plaques. Uh, George Innes installed the first uh, megavoltage X-ray unit in the world that was used to treat um, for patients. And that's back in 1936. Professor Joseph Rotblatt was our head of physics uh, in the 50s and 60s, and he won the um, Peace Prize for his work for the Pugwash Society after um, his original work with Oppenheimer and the atomic bomb. Since then, we've had Hyla Stallard, Mike Bedford, and my dear old boss, John Hungerford, have all made uh, contributions to our service in London. Currently, I think we're the only British centre for oncology that treats both adult and paediatric ocular tumours. We're one of um, three super regional services in England and a fourth in Scotland. And on our side, we're split between St. Bartholomew's and Moorfields. At the moment, all the inpatient work's done at St. Bartholomew's and we run a weekly uh, clinic at Moorfields. There's a lot of people involved in this service, um, not just you know, the odd one standing in front of you today. Um, we have a lot of support from both nursing, admin, and all our consultant colleagues in a variety of fields, medically, surgically. And it's with everyone's work together that we manage to keep the service going. One of the questions about referrals is that we've certainly in London, and I'm sure elsewhere, have seen quite a large increase in referral rates to us. Uh, we had a peer review earlier this year when we looked at some of the data. And it turns out in the last seven years, we've had an over 300% increase in new referrals to us. So the work has certainly um, been ballooning. And the same is true then with the number of positives that are found, quite a few negative results and quite a few that we are still um, watching a suspicious nevi and under investigation. But it just shows how the service has grown. And the same is true if you look at our outpatient attendances. They too have taken off in that last decade. I always say our goal in ocular oncology is unlike the rest of ophthalmology. Our primary goal is to save the patient's life, then save the patient's eyeball, and then their eyesight. And sometimes you have to sacrifice their eyesight and sometimes their eyeball in order to try and save their life. Um, if you look in the sort of Royal College website, there are printed guidelines as to what one should be referring onto specialist units. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but they're all available. We also have included the ones what not to refer. Certainly in London, we, we don't deal with eyelids, we don't deal with orbits. So they usually go to ocular plastics, lid oncology, we'd refer them to our colleagues at Moorfields. So what is it you look at? Um, we say nevi or moles are the most common tumours in the eye. Some papers suggest it's up to 10% of the adult population that has a nevus in one eye or the other. I think probably 5% is, is nearer the mark. But generally, they're flat or very minimally elevated. Uh, usually sort of a greyish colour, they can be pale. And usually under 6 millimetres across. And the risk of malignant transformation in a plain nevus 
it's just under one in 9,000 per year. So there's lots of nevi and relatively very few tumors. And I'm sure um, Heinrich's talked about this today. This is sort of the, it's become the, the classic acronym uh, for TFSOM. And these are the risk factors where we try and assess what's um, an important sign to look for. Before this came out, John Hungerford used to always say to me, it's at the top out of those, the top three is thickness, fluid, and orange pigment. If you have one, it's a suspicious nevus. If you have two, it's a very suspicious nevus. And you have all three, he counts that as positive, and you should treat it. There are now proper studies that have sort of helped look at risk ratios, um, and it's been expanded further. And so we've got some nice pictures. These are the sort of things you generally see. They're usually small, often not terribly well defined, but they tend to look chronic, especially this drusen and RPE change on some of them. So sort of down here, little sort of greyish spots on the surface, RPE changes. They, they have a chronic look about them. Retinal pigment epithelium. And they're the ones that hopefully are uh, less worrying. We were saying about earlier on about follow-up. Um, we do tend to have quite long follow-ups at London patients. And here's a case from a few years ago, uh, presented with a sort of egg nevus at the edge of the macula here. So you, you moved over, and there's the photograph. And an ultrasound, it was 1.5 millimetres. So Technically, it had no of the five main category risk factors. So they came back for review a year later. Looks much the same. Ultrasound's much the same. Same at two years. And then at six years, it started growing. And here we have a, a nodule sort of growing off one side. And now that sort of elevated, uh, what we call collar stud shape developing, which is quite pathognomic of some of these melanomas. It's that they develop what looks like a mushroom. So what I suggest for, you know, out in your DGH kind of scenario, if you see a nevus, I think everyone should have a baseline fundal photograph. If they're elevated, you should have a baseline B scan. And then periodic observation. If there's signs of growth, signs of uh, whether it's vertical or horizontal, and it's becoming more suspicious, then you know, I think that's the right time to refer on. And then we may look at it and decide what to do next, you know, whether it's just uh, we'll carry on watching because we don't have enough factors, or we'll intervene and, and start some form of treatment. I think the trouble with TTT, I'd say to the patients, it's like cooking turkey in the oven. You can burn the skin to a crisp and leave it raw in the middle. So you get a lovely reaction on the outside, but it doesn't always penetrate through. So it's certainly no use in larger tumours. Because, I mean, your, your, your takeaway message from the talk was that this is no longer something that you... Yeah, I think the only one you could potentially do would be a small, thin tumour outside of the macular arcade. You get a much larger scar than you think, um, so it'll disturb vision if it's anywhere near the macula. So we generally only use it as adjunctive treatment. Second line for a little edge recurrence, or we're giving it to sort of juxtapapillary tumours very near the nerve if they're given plaque brachytherapy just to supplement the dose. So 
we don't use it anymore. So that's really helpful. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's way too right. So I thought we'll put a few pictures in melanomas. You know, what are we looking for? You say, uh, of all, we've been hearing about melanomas generally, of all melanomas, particularly cutaneous ones, UV melanomas are about 1 in 20. And they aren't the same. They're a different beast. Um, I say to the patients, basically on a, around 1 in 20 adults, by the time you're middle-aged or on, is likely to have a choroidal nevus in one eye or the other. So melanomas occur in about 7 per million of the population. Um, and there's a similar incidence across the Western world, including you know, USA, Australia, where the ultraviolet light levels are higher. Uh, but not to frighten people, overall the numbers are still quite small. As it often says in almost every uh, journal paper, uh, the first, most common first line is uveal melanomas are the most common intraocular tumours. Um, we can split them anatomically. And we say about 80% or so is developing the choroid, 15% probably ciliary body, and less than 5% in the iris. It's generally a disease that's almost always unilateral. Um, bilateral disease or multifocal disease is very rare, but we have a few. It tends to occur in the, as, a, as a rule in the older Caucasian patients, um, often quite fair-skinned, and there are risk factors which is underlying uh, melanocytosis, melanocytomas, and neurofibromatosis. Just to say, etiology is still a bit of a puzzle. Um, it's thought about sunlight. When you think about the skin, you think the same. But the human eye has a, a pigment within it that tends to reduce blue entering the eye. And ultraviolet light doesn't penetrate very far due to its wavelength. So, Theoretically, physics would say it doesn't get to the back of the eye in any great concentration. And if you look at epidemiological studies, um, where populations have been looked at, and there's been you know, a doubling of skin melanomas in the last generation or two, there's not been that sort of increase in um, ocular melanomas. So if there was a sort of similar etiology, you'd expect some sort of significant rise. But what you tend to see is a rise just in line with an ageing population. There's a slide on incidence, just to demonstrate it tends to occur you know, in patients in their 50s, 60s, 70s. And the incidence in, a, um, in the United States has been much the same in a period of uh, 9, 25 years. So things to look for when the patient sits in front of you is, do you have symptoms? People will say all sorts of things. And um, you might have a runny eye, it's itchy, it's all coming. Usually when someone's told them there's a potential tumour in their eye, all the symptoms come out. But the classic ones are these are visual phenomena inside the eyeball. So disturbance of vision, whether it's photopsia, flashing lights, uh, metamorphopsia, you know, just disturbance of central vision, scotomas. But about one in three are found by chance. As a rule, the ones that are at the posterior pole, the center of your eye, tend to be found earlier because they give you symptoms, but it's generally worse for visual prognosis because not only does the tumor damage the central vision, our therapy may well add to that. Um, and I think it was Bertil in Liverpool and yourselves who came up with the, the little acronym uh, for melanoma. And the sort of classic signs you should look for. So first of all, that there's any sort of tumour outside the eye is very suspicious. Do you have the right kind of um, symptoms, photopsia and disturbed vision? Are there any lens abnormalities? Do you have a sexual cataract, induced stigmatism, an afferent pupillary defect, that the spectacles don't help their symptoms? They may have raised pressure in the eye. They may have increased pigmentation in the eye. And I've got a photo uh, of uh, one of sentinel vessels, big dilated juicy vessels. And that's the kind of thing you see if you follow these people long enough. Uh, on the left is the original tumour, a little suspicious maybe, it's got large drusen, probably looks about two, two and a half millimetres elevated, was watched, and lo and behold, a lump starts to appear. Uh, 
Uh, and then a few more examples. Um, this is the, I'm sure again, Heinrich's talked about it, but the sort of low to medium internal reflectivity on a B scan. And to a Doppler scan, you can show blood flow within the lesions. Uh, we rarely ever really see this in clinical practice, but what is said to be a double circulation on a fundus fluorescein angiogram. No one should be missing these things. You know, large masses, like little volcanoes growing out of the eye. That's, that's the collar stud shape. Maybe a little harder to diagnose are the diffuse tumours, where, by definition, they are five times greater in width than they are in height. The trouble with the diffuse melanomas is that they tend to have microscopic fingers of cells growing further than you can see. So you could, maybe you could plaque it, because they're quite thin, but you'll often find the relapse rate is higher because the edges haven't been completely covered and they need close review. You're forever battling against diffuse melanomas. And some of them can be you know, occupying 30, 40% of the choroid. Uh, always look for retinal detachments. So here, the mass is there on the left-hand picture, but they have an exudative detachment. We've got the odd case who happen to have a regmatogenous detachment um, at coincidentally. So it has been missed. They've all assumed the detachment was because of the tumour, when in fact there were two pathologies coexisting. The hardest thing with, I think, oncology is to find the small tumour. When is the right time to intervene? And these are the sort of cases you'd see where you know, they've got something that's not very large, but it's got some orange pigment in it. Um, and if you, particularly on a photograph, you stand back, you can generally see a puddle of fluid, which you can pick up from visual examination, OCT, and you'd expect the patient to have visual symptoms with it. Other things you might find, uh, sometimes you can get very large benign moulds. They may measure four or five millimetres. They look huge, but they don't grow. We watch them, we watch them, and nothing happens. And we're thankful. Metastatic tumours, uh, often you know, lung, breast, sometimes bowel, but they tend to be this sort of leopard spot. Um, they're usually not very elevated, tend to be around the posterior pole, but they often leak a great deal. So they get a lot of symptoms and um, things develop rapidly in them. So the time scale is also a bit of a clue. Choroidal hemangiomas, it's a vascular lesion. Because it's made of blood vessels, it's the same color as the background. So they tend to be quite orange. And often when people send us photographs, you find you can't see them in the picture because they've disappeared. Um, but again, when you do investigations, OCT, FFA, ICG, uh, that'll give a clue as to their underlying etiology. A chirpy is, a con is congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium. Very well, sharply demarcated lesions, usually singular, um, and when they're early stages, almost jet black. Then as the years and decades go by, they start to develop little lacunae, little pale patches within them, and characteristically a ring of pallor around, so they have a bullseye effect. We probably get one of these, or two a week, elderly patients with AMD who basically develop a bleed uh, outside of the posterior pole, so present with a hemorrhagic PED and a neovascular membrane, but it mimics a tumour. People look in the eye and see a dark mass and refer on. And we probably get one of these every uh, couple of weeks or so. Hard to pick up on a photograph, but it's there. I had one on Friday. Young lady in her 20s, anxious, worried, referred because of a lump in the eye. Um, these are dilated ampullae of the veins. They're found in the four sort of quadrants. And characteristically, if you look at them on the slit lamp, you just press gently on the eyeball, put the intraocular pressure up, and they flatten. They disappear in front of your eyes. You let go, they come back out again. 
It's just an anatomical variant, nothing of concern. Ciliary body masses, uh, often much larger when they present because they've been growing behind the iris, hidden away. They can grow forwards into the anterior chamber. They can go backwards into the choroid or towards the center of the eye, pushing the lens, causing a cataract, causing visual symptoms. And uh, an ultrasound of one of them. And there's a sentinel vessel. The number of patients who don't notice this themselves is quite astounding. You point out, haven't you noticed that your one eye is so red, and the big juicy dilated vessels feeding the tumour on the inside? And they'll often say, nope, didn't they? Uh, just a short thing on iris, they're a little bit more difficult. They are rare in comparison. Um, they're generally very slow growing and a low malignant potential. So if you're going to have a tumour, that's the place to have it. Things we look for, again, nodular growths particularly. Do you have an ectropian UV, though that's not pathognomic? Particularly is that invasion into the trabecular meshwork, locally or further away. And it's said to occur more often in the inferior half of your iris, although I've got a picture of one above. Um, but if you see mainly on this one, on the gonioscopy photo, there's a raised dome and there's pigment encroaching in the angle, starting to grow. I'll leave this to Heinrich, very much so, on uh, the, the genetics of it. But there's more and more evidence about tumours. I've said it's not really to make a diagnosis. You know, this is, it, it adds very much to the prognostication and information for the patient as well as for ourselves. Um, but it's, own, it's a part of the overall evaluation. Um, just to skip through some of this, really, because I'm sure it's been talked about already. Same sort of thing, treatment options from observation down to major surgery. Our basic protocol at London is uh, I put observation for small I mean, If you think it's a melanoma, you'll treat it. But at one end of the scale observation, usually we're looking at some form of radiotherapy. Um, our first line is still plaques, proton beam, maybe then surgery. And for the larger tumors, often a nucleation um, and depending on some radiotherapy. And you have to take all the various factors in, you know, the patient's preferences, their age, their, their morbidity and general health. Um, so we've been doing plaques since 1929 at Barts. Um, as I say, it was invented there by Foster Moore. The original idea was just to put a radon seed into the tumour of the eye and leave it there. But then the idea came that why don't we put the seeds on a device on the outside of the eye and point them inwards. So it was Stallard and his physicist George Innes who introduced the idea using cobalt-60 in those days. We now use ruthenium-106, which is a uh, high-energy beta source predominantly. You tend to get less scatter, hopefully less side effects, but it um, doesn't treat the same thickness as, say, an iodine blackwood. And it will take a few months to see the effect. You're not going to see anything happen in a week's. That's the kind of thing we see, just a little dummy at the top, which helps to help us position it accurately. Um, and then the plaques there at the bottom, uh, with these little Mickey Mouse ears to sew it in place. Our work at uh, London has shown that, depending on the size of your tumour, we can get around 95% success rate for tumour control in the eye. If you've got a tumour under five millimetres in thickness, and surprisingly, the figure suggested about 86%, between five, six, maybe seven at the most. The problem above that sort of size is that you start to get um, scleral damage from the plaque. Uh, and we work on a thousand gray maximum to the scleral surface. So that also limits how much um, radiation you can give and what sort of size tumor. So really the useful range is about six, six and a half millimeters. They are uh, made by Bebbage, which was used to be in East Germany, now a German company. Um, we have a selection of them in different sizes. Um, they're either circular or they have a notch cut for the optic nerve. And they're reused constantly. 
So um, they last about a year of sort of active use, and they're in and out all the time. So they're not made to an individual patient, but the dosimetry is calculated for each individual patient. So the physicist works out from our figures. Um, you know, this, we give them the sizes, the doses we want to give. He works out the dose rates and what's the right plaque. Nothing too fast, nothing too slow. The difference with uh, the American iodine plaques, basically, is that you can put the iodine pellets in specific locations. So you can tailor make it more to the eye itself. The standard idea is you just make the eyeball glow in, the, in a darkened operating theatre, and the tumour, hopefully, will cast a shadow. You can mark out your shadow um, and then use that to put the plaque into place. So you cover the whole tumour with a safety margin around. And there can be some great recurrent, great effects. Big masses shrink down really well. So, so how thick of a tumour can you treat? I think generally we work on the premise that up to five we'd expect good results. I mean, 90, 95% success in the eye. Once you cross five millimetres, it started to drop off. Five and six, six and a half, we, on our study, we were getting about 85, 86% success. As you get to six and a half, seven, it's starting to drop off. So we have a cutoff, at, you know, unless there's a specific reason. We have got a, an elderly lady at the moment who's got a you know, seven millimetre tumour in her only eye. And you know, it's hard then to say to her, well, we need to put protons, something that can maybe more destructive and potentially then lose vision faster. So she's opted within a reduced success rate to go for a plaque and try and, for her age and everything, to try and protect her eye as much as she can. But I think realistically, the figures would suggest um, the scleral dose starts to become an issue at about six and a half millimetres. So I think that is pretty much the cutoff for patients. Uh, the other option is proton beam. Um, which is a centre in Clatterbridge. It's a little bit more work. The patient has tantalum markers put on the eye to help mark the tumour. They go to Clatterbridge, they stay for a week and have their treatment there. I put a line there that the trouble is significant minority do have complications. Uh, we tell them that about one in 10 patients will end up losing their eye because of secondary complications, particularly near vascular glaucoma. If you have a significant retinal detachment, when you went for your treatment, that is probably near a 50%. So even though it's an effective therapy, there is a um, you know, significant number who will end up having to have their eye removed from complications. If all else fails, if you can't do anything else, you can remove the eye. And if the tumor is already too large or it's failed from other treatments, we use a hydroxyapatite orbital implant covered with a Vicrol mesh. Uh, it's put in at the time of surgery. They can generally have a, a temporary prosthesis within about, I say three to four weeks, probably nearest five to six. Uh, and then the artificial eye service will make them a molded prosthesis. Um, and we only give orbital radiotherapy if the pathologist says that there's evidence of tumor either outside of the eye, I mean, it was grossly extrascleral, if there's cells at the optic nerve margin, um, you know, exit points of veins and nerves. So we don't do it routinely. It, it's quite destructive to the tissue that's left behind. It's never, the tissue's never the same if you, give them, if you gave everybody. And there's no real evidence that actually it makes any difference. A uh, COM study looked at that, found giving external beam radiotherapy was not um, uh, an advantage and has disadvantages doing it. Uh, as we've been hearing about all day, you know, unfortunately, this is a tumour that can spread. Our policy in London is that all patients will have a chest X-ray, liver function test measurements, and high-resolution liver ultrasound, or abdominal ultrasound. If you've got a significant sized tumour, five millimetres or above, we'll also have a PET-CT. We um, Pending the results of the, the work going on at the moment, we screen our patients with six monthly LFTs and repeat ultrasounds. But we wait to see what the final outcome is from the, the body looking into this. And then people ask about prognostications. What's the chance, doc, of it spreading? 
Um, so there's, there's comms data, the shields in Philadelphia um, came up, very large numbers, which they call, they call the 5% rule. That roughly, there's so many other factors that take play a part in this, but roughly, for every five millimeters, for every millimeter of tumor thickness, you've got a 5% mortality rate due to it. That's a rough idea, if you really want to know. Yeah. I think the COM study was the first major randomized control trial that really looked into these questions. Um, and I won't go into any of it, but it basically said for those medium sized tumors that brachytherapy had an equivalent survival to removing the eye. So it, you know, it does work, uh, and that there was no benefit from external beam radiotherapy before nucleating eye, reducing the risk. Uh, these are particularly for the larger tumors. So, you know, we will try and plaque you if we can. And we don't give you radiotherapy unless you absolutely need it based on the pathology report. So, well, you know, don't worry. It sounds horrible. Um, but stay calm. Carry on. A little look at conjunctival tumors uh, in front of the eye. The classic thing we're taught is the no-touch technique, which is basically when you operate, don't put cells from the tumor elsewhere. So if you're manipulating the samples, keep the instruments to one side. So if you're using forceps, keep it on the tumor side. Don't use the same forceps anywhere else. The swabs, and etc. don't dab in lots of different places. What I say, the no-touch technique, is please don't touch it. We'd rather you don't biopsy things if you think they are tumors. There's always going to be cases where you've, you've taken a pterygium out and it surprised you with the pathology. But if you really think it's a tumor, we'd rather say send it on. Certainly don't do an incisional biopsy because you may just spread tumor cells everywhere. We have patients where there's been quite a big delay. They, they've had local surgery, the results gone to a local pathologist who said, well, I'm not sure referred the specimen somewhere else, the patients got lost in the system, turned up nine months later, and then got referred on, and has been sitting on a tumor for the best part of a year. We may not have any photographs of what the actual lesion looked like when they get referred. Don't always have a lot of information on what sort of surgery was actually done, did you have cryotherapy? Mm -hmm. um, and I say again, the pathology part, all of our specimens go to the Institute of Ophthalmology and are, and are seen by ocular pathologists. Kind of stuff we see um, quite often. I've not gone into the sort of the, the lumps and bumps and nevi and, and, and sort of papillomas. Things to look for. Um, a class called ocular surface squamous neoplasia, which is a, a, a really a gamut of things. They all have something in common. They're all related to local immune deficiency on the surface of the eye. Tend to be rather sort of papillary or gelatinous masses, often around the bulba and limbus area. Now, these are the kind of things that turn up. They sort of thickened papillomatous look about them. And then you can, there are lots of treatments, you can cut them out, um, but they do tend to come back. They may be, I think is the best answer. It's not 100%, but there is um, an HPV correlation between them. It tends to be people who often have worked outdoors a great deal, uh, on the water, because the ultraviolet light reflection, by the sea, maybe a sunlight component, lived in hot climates. CIN, conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia, is sort of a halfway house. The tumours aren't malignant, but they aren't normal either. And they're graded as to the degree of atypicality, so you know, mild to severe. If you do nothing and they grow, they can then develop into true squamous cell carcinoma. And, you know, they just look nasty. Large, thick masses, big feeder vessels. You know, I mean, everyone can see that shouldn't happen. Last Friday, we had a patient, he's an Asian man. Um, he had CIN some years ago, he was under the service at the London and he uh, DNA'd and hasn't been seen for years. He has a history of 
uh, I think lymphoma treated many years ago in remission, also recently prostatic carcinoma. He came and said, because I caught the vomiting bug last December, and ever since my eye's been getting worse. And he got referred by his own oncologist to us uh, earlier in the year, didn't attend three appointments like usual, pitched up last Friday, and he looks like this. So his eyelids are swollen, and he has an ulcer growing on the medial part of his eyelids, both upper and lower. And when you lift his lids up, you can't find his eyeball. It is covered completely in this papillomatous solid mass. Uh, he's got an enormous recurrence of probably CIN with squamous cell component. And how you can leave your eye to become like this, I do not understand. Um, we use uh, strontium, which is a surface applicator, another form of brachytherapy, as an sort of adjunct to the treatment. You don't need to refer these, which is racial melanosis uh, in, in pigmented races. You find little patches, a fairly benign looking uh, melanosis on the conjunctiva, sometimes sclera, and often it's bilateral. So that's not worrying, and best left alone. Primary acquired melanosis is, a, is, a, is, a, is the equivalent of CIN in melanoma cells. Um, these are patches of flat, often generally unilateral melanocytosis. Can be anywhere on the conjunctival surface. You can only know for sure if you take a sample and find out. But what we want to know with PAM is do you have atypia? How atypical are these cells? Because if they aren't atypical under a microscope, you have almost zero risk of developing a melanoma. If you have severe atypia at the other end, it's 50% risk. And the goal with these patients is to monitor them. We monitor them every four months for the first two years, and then every six months thereafter for the rest of their life, because they're always at risk of developing a tumour. Nevi, lots of them around, tend to have them when you're very young, uh, often on the surface of the eyeball itself, and a good sign is they've got little cysts within them, no big feeder vessels, low risk of developing a tumour in your lifetime, but watch out for nevi in atypical positions, fornix, tarsus. Now you don't get nevi there, and that's more worrying. That's the kind of nevi, you know, just little flat pigment, no feeder vessels, full of little tiny cysts, likely to be uh, quite benign. And then melanomas, you know, again, people in their 60s, quite a lot of them have got PAM underlying, even if they don't know it. Um, again, usually around the limbus, the bulbar surface, then the tarsus and fornix. But you can't really miss that. It turns up in clinic. But again, best send it on to a, a centre. Don't, don't try and cut this out yourself. They uh, you know, can recur. They do spread. Especially in the PAM patients, uh, a minority, but a significant minority over their lifetime will end up having to be exenterated because you just cannot keep cutting out so much conjunctiva. It does spread and it does, you know, it still has a significant mortality rate, not to be underestimated. And as I always say, uh, at the end of every clinic and every new patient, you think to yourself, could I have got that all wrong? But I hope not. Thank you. Yep, yeah, one down. Are there any other questions? Can I ask you about is your uh, biopsy with conjunctival yep. lesions? Because earlier on the talk, Professor Hyman and I talked about how such a lesion turned out to be um, an early melanoma. Indeed. And then about you were saying about not biopsy. Okay, so should these lesions to be all sent, especially centers. I mean, you're going to have a huge amount of patients coming with uh, Which is true. Um, so. Should we biopsy? I think there's two parts. I think you used to make conjunctiva. I think the other point is choroidal biopsies as well when it comes to diagnosing in the eye. Uh, 
with conjunctivas, I mean, I think we'll, we're always going to get patients where they, they've been to their local department, they, they've cut them out and were surprised. They didn't think it was a tumour. I mean, fair enough. Um, I think if you get a melanoma or something like the pictures we've seen, it's probably better to leave it alone. If, you, if you've got access to a specialist unit, refer it on. Um, our problem is that we often get the patient afterwards. We don't know what it actually looked like, what was the extent, and what was done to it. And it might be you know, easier, they'll need follow-up, we'll often be following them up ourselves. It'd be nice to be there at the start. Yeah, and the problem will come what for the, the op, uh, visible or obvious tumours. Mm. They'll get to take themselves straight away. It is subtle pigmented lesion yeah. which you quite yeah. hardly see. And okay. patients report, you know, it's been there for six months, nine months. And we tend to observe them. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I think that is probably the, the better option. Look for growth, yeah. look for change, and, and, and refer on. Um, I mean, things like the, the PAM, that's a difficult one. You know, a straightforward nevus, racial melanosis, we say leave it alone, you know, really don't do anything to them. PAM's difficult. So if you've got a lot of pigmentation, um, particularly, say, in other areas under the lid, fornix, things where you wouldn't find a mole, I think that's probably worth a second opinion. Uh, we'll often do a little biopsy ourselves and then try and get a histopathological diagnosis. With choroidal biopsies for tumours in the eye, our general policy is not to do it. I think it's, it's extra surgery. Um, you tend to get uh, in basically a small sample, so you may not get a definite answer on the sample you give the pathologist. So you may still be, after one operation, still be at the same point before you started. And third is the theoretical risk that you may be spreading tumour cells. So I've opened the eye to take a sample out. Have I not spread a few cells into the orbital area as well? So we try and get as much sort of non-invasive information and evidence when you're thinking about treating patients. But every once in a while, you have to do it because you've got no other way of forgetting a tissue diagnosis. Hmm. We, I was saying you know, earlier, we, our, our standard policy, if you send us a patient, if it's absolutely no risk factors, looks very benign, we'd be happy with that. If you send it to us and say, um, you know, I've been watching it, I'm worried about growth, it's a bit suspicious, we will tend to watch for usually around two or three years. So usually four months, then six months, maybe annually, two to three years. And if there's been no change in that period, we'll discharge you back. We don't often send people straight home because we've never seen it before either, that patient's eye. And I don't know on the day you come to clinic whether what you had was there six months ago, five years ago. So unless it's absolutely straightforward, we'll tend to watch for a while. Uh, with that kind of patient, you, know, you can't follow them, all of them up indefinitely. It's just, it isn't the capacity to do it. So I think we're saying about risk factors. If you've got one of those main, particularly the main three factors, so over two millimetres thick, orange pigment, subretinal fluid, you can, you know, we would watch, and often for some years, infrequently, maybe down to just annually at the end. If you've got no risk factors, then, you know, you're the same as anybody else. Um, so we'll watch, we'll then, you know, to say we'll write back to you and say, okay, it's 1.5 millimetres, it's been much the same, would you be able to uh, keep a, a, a watch for them locally? But as you said, you know, we do need to get you photographs and maybe copies of ultrasounds and things to, to follow the patient too. We always say it's about a, if you have one of the big three, you've got a 30% risk uh, for each uh, suspicious feature of developing a melanoma. So two out of three, maybe 60% chance. Three out of three, we say that's 100% treated.